Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We're in a series called The Armor of God. Last week we talked about the belt of truth. And if you did not see that sermon, if you, didn't, if you weren't here or didn't watch it online, I, I cannot encourage you enough, go to our website, watch last week's sermon. It is probably the best, most balanced, informational teaching on the belt of truth that I have ever heard, if I do say so myself, and it's not just because I wrote it, okay? It really is a great, great teaching on the belt of truth, and I hope to kind of buddy up to that with the teaching today on the breastplate of righteousness, and I will admit that I rather call it the chest plate of righteousness because saying breast in church just seems wrong, but the Bible says breastplate of righteousness, so we're going to have to say that today, okay? Ephesians 6.14 is our text for today. Uh, it says, stand therefore, having gird your waist with truth, that's the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, if you've been here for any length of time, you understand, you know how I like to study the Bible, how I like to put together my sermons. I ask questions. As I read the Bible, I ask questions. I like to challenge the status quo. I like to challenge what has always been, what has always been taught. And so I read this and I think to myself, how is righteousness a weapon? How can righteousness be a weapon. Righteousness is right standing with God. It's having a right relationship with God. How is right standing with God a piece of armor? How is it a weapon? 2 Corinthians 6, 7 tells us that by the word of truth, belt of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. There's another verse that's telling us that's a piece of armor. It's a piece of weaponry. Isaiah 59, Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah 59, 17 says, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Let's take a minute and pray. Father, we thank you for your word today that it will never return to you void. It will accomplish what you desire it to do today. I pray that as we get into your word, that you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come, speak to our hearts, and let us hear something that maybe is brand new in Jesus' name. Amen. I will admit, I got a little ornery first service. I did. I got a little ornery first service. Righteousness is one of my topics. It's one of those things that gets my motor running, studying righteousness, preaching righteousness, preaching righteousness or grace, a relationship with God, it, it really excites me when I study it and when I preach it. So you will have to bear with me if I get a little fighty today. Is that all right? Righteousness is, in fact, a piece of armor. But I want to take a moment, and I want to study this out like I do in, in our Bible school, okay? Uh, we're going to do a deep dive in understanding what was Paul's intention by telling us that righteousness is a breastplate? What was he thinking about when he was looking at the Roman soldier's armor and he says, oh, the breastplate is righteousness? Let's, let's begin to understand this. The breastplate was the shiniest, most beautiful, most glamorous piece of armor that the Roman soldier possessed. When people walked up to the Roman soldier, they did not first look at their belt, right? We spoke about that last week. It was never like, yo, that belt in the right place. No, it was the breastplate. The breastplate hung on the body of the Roman soldier from the top of the neck to, to his knees. That's a big piece of armor. That's a big piece of armor. It immediately took your attention. It was two pieces of metal, one piece on the front, one piece on the back, and it was hung together by big rings up on the shoulders. 
in many cases, on top of that metal would be smaller pieces of metal that were positioned a lot like the scales on a fish, overlapping pieces of metal on top of that armor. The average breastplate weighed about 40 pounds. Now, if you've ever gone to the gym and picked up a 45-pound plate, that's pretty exhausting carrying that around for a while, right? Put it in a backpack, put it on your shoulders. 40 pounds is quite heavy. Goliath, if you remember him in the Bible, Goliath's breastplate weighed 125 pounds, the Bible says. Just, just that. The, the, the spear tip on his, on his spear was a 40-pound uh, spearhead on Goliath's spear. Just, just to think about how massive and strong that guy was. All right? 40-pound 40, 40 breastplate. It was extremely elaborate. It was extremely beautiful. It was made out of either bronze or brass normally brass. And the more a Roman soldier wore their breastplate, the more they walked around in it and marched in it, something incredible would happen. Those little pieces of metal, as they would rub together with movement, would polish each other. They would polish each other. And although it was already shiny and bright, the more the breastplate was used, the more it was wore, the shinier, the more luster came about on it. This is exactly what would happen with their armor day in and day out. Those pieces would rub together, it become beautiful, bright, shiny. Brass already has a golden color that shines, but now, over time and using it, can you imagine how blinding one of these pieces of armor might be in the sunlight? A Roman soldier coming out with all of those shiny scales of armor, walking out into the sunlight. It would be like a disco ball in the daylight, blinding. Have you ever been driving down the road and you come around a curve on a sunny day and the sun hits you just right and you're trying to get the sun visor but you can't and you're just hoping to God that you're still on the road? Right? You can see a little bit how it could be a weapon. It's shiny. It's bright. It's blinding. If the breastplate had been stored in a dark room and never used, its brilliance would never be known. If it sat and was never used, it wouldn't have the opportunity to get brighter and brighter and brighter. And and I wonder if the church at large has a misunderstanding of righteousness. I wonder if the church at large keeps their righteousness hidden in a closet so they don't mess it up. So they don't dent it. So they don't stain it. When, when, when the design and the idea is for your righteousness to be worn, and the more you wear your righteousness, the brighter it shines. I know, it's confusing. You have no idea where I'm going with this, right? Because there's a misconception of what righteousness is. Righteousness is not the things you do. Righteousness isn't something that you do. Righteous is what you've been made. You have been made righteous. You don't do righteous deeds. got this idea that if I mess up, that's because I took my righteousness off. No. Nope. That, 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 that's not at all. That's not at all what Paul is trying to show us in this passage and what he's saying about putting on the armor of God. We got to unpack this. We got to unpack this. Could you imagine what it would look like for a Roman soldier fully dressed in his bronze armor who has perfected it and known it and wore it when he steps into the sunlight of battle, what that might look like. Could you imagine an army of soldiers marching in unison together, cresting a hillside on a sunny day, overlooking their enemy, what that might look like? The rays of sunlight all over the place. 
it would be blinding. So let's apply these principles of a Roman soldier's armor to your righteousness. The more you wear your righteousness, walking through your life, fully conscious that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, the more brightly you will shine in the dark places of this world. Do you know what I can't stand? False humility. Anybody else? False humility just makes you so upset. Like, you ever met somebody who is so humble, they're proud of it? Huh? Oh, you know, yeah, you know, Pastor, you know, it's just so, just so nice to be there. Like, ew. Ew. Timidity is not the same thing as humility. God never asked us to be timid. He said be bold as lions. Pastor Mike, you know, if the Lord just desires, if the Lord just desires for it to happen, you know, I just believe, you know, the Lord willing, the Lord willing. Can we just stop with that? Like, seriously, can we just stop with it? Because that's false humility. It really is, in a lot of ways. All that talk is false humility, timidity. The Bible says, it is my will that thou wast prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. It is my will that all men come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is my will. He didn't, no, listen, 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 listen. Was it God's will for you to have that McDonald's cheeseburger last night? Oh, so you only care what's his will sometimes. Come on, can we be for real in the logic of the things that we're talking about? Hey, you gonna be in church next week? Yeah, Lord willing. Well, are you going to get up out of bed or not? <laughs> the Lord willing. Lord willing what? You're not sure you're going to have a car accident and die during the week? I mean, like, what are you saying? The righteous will walk by faith. What's your faith confession? What's your faith confession? What's your faith confession? Because we keep putting it back on God. Well, I'm not really going to make any decisions in life. I'm just going to blame it on God. And if it doesn't work out, well, the Lord willing. If it works out, hey, great, well, the Lord willing. Not really, you know how, when it works out, yeah, I did a good job, didn't I? I told you I was going to be ornery today. Because we're talking about putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Putting on your relationship with God and walking around like you're somebody. Do you think my son knocks on my office door when he wants to come in? That little punk, I'll be in the middle of a straight business meeting, and my son just whoosh, walking in because he knows where the candy drawer is. He's got confidence. This is my dad's office. You know what that means? If it's my dad's office, it's my office. And that's how he walks in. It's a picture of God when he says to us, come boldly into the throne room of grace and make your request known before God. I can come in here. I can access God, not because of what I've done, not because what I haven't done, but because of what Christ has done. I'm righteous. I'm righteous. There's nothing that changes my son's name from McKelvey. He's McKelvey, no matter his condition. No matter his condition, when he was a clean baby or a dirty baby, I didn't really like care for the smell of it, but he was still my son. And he was still a McKelvey. There was nothing that changed the fact that my son is my son is my son. He's a McKelvey. His name is mine. That's who you are in the kingdom of God. You're righteous. And the more you wear your righteousness, the more that you put it on and walk around in your life and operate in it, the bigger your chest gets. <laughs> I am his and he is mine. I am the Lord's. I am the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. But here's what happens. 
Here's what happens. Ephesians 6.11, he says, put on the whole armor of God so that we are able to. So that we are able. We are able, right? So without God, you're not able. Without God, you ain't able. You're not able. He gives you the ability. We are able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And hear me, the devil wants to assault you. The devil wants to assault you, and where did we say he's going to bring the attack? In our mind, the battlefield of the mind. And what he wants to attack is your understanding of your righteousness. He wants to attack you with thoughts of, you're not good enough. You're a bum. You're a loser. No one's going to love you the way you deserve to be loved. You're always going to be angry. Nobody likes you. You'll never have any friends. You're not good enough for God. You're going to go to hell. You're so full of sin. This is what the devil wants to bombard your mind with over and over and over. He's not really so much attacking you. He's attacking your righteousness, your right standing, your belief about who you are in God. What does the word devil mean? It's the Greek word diabolos. Diabolos. In Spanish, it's diablo, right? Diabolos. And, it's, and it means this, one who strikes again and again and again and again and again until finally he penetrates the mind with slanderous accusations. You're not good enough. You never will be. You're never going to make it. You're never going to make it. God's never going to use you. You're going to struggle with this the rest of your life. You're going to die this way. These slanderous accusations that just puts you down, makes you feel defeated. He wants to whisper these things into your mind. And if you don't have the breastplate of righteousness firmly in its place, those accusations will affect your mind and your emotions. It will affect your mind and your emotions. And if this happens, then the devil effectively will blow an injury against you spiritually. I've seen spiritually wounded people and how they walk away from God. Maybe you've called them backsliders, right? And the church gets so judgy. I just, you just got to love, you just got to love judgy people who didn't read John 3.17. We all know John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, who believes in the have everlasting life. We all know that one. But the next one? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through him set them free, bring deliverance and freedom. See, we forget that one because we think it's our job to do what Christ didn't do. Well, since Christ didn't judge everybody, I'm going to do it. That ain't your job, baby. Eyes on your own paper. You're already failing the test. <laughs> you already failing the test. Stop looking at someone else's paper who's failing too. Right? I've seen, and, and the church wants to get so judgy and judge someone who's backslidden. And we judge the behavior. And we think it's the behavior, but it's really in the mind. Yeah, they messed up. They made a mistake. But then the enemy got in there and began to torment their mind to, to the point where they, I, I cannot go back to church. And we're okay with that. And we're okay with people. Who do bad behavior not coming back to God? That's not okay. As if. Listen, I got into, a, I got into some fights on social media last few weeks. <laughs> like to the place where I had to block people. And if I blocked you, I'm not sorry. You need to read your Bible. I made a, I made a post. I made a comment. I made a post. I said... The Christian church is going to be surprised at all the people who are in heaven that they disqualified. We might as well get along now. Right? Yo! I got straight up attacked. Right? Had to delete some people. Got me in the flesh. Got me in righteous indignation. 
This one individual slaying me. Well, what about this kind of people? They can't go to heaven, and then these people can't go to heaven, and these people can't go to heaven. And then they got me mad. They got me mad because this person's obese. So I said, oh, can fat people go to heaven? <laughs> got me mad. I said, a fa I said the F word. I said the F word. You know, fat's offensive nowadays. You can't say that word. I said, well, gluttony's in the Bible. Gluttony's a sin in the Bible. Can they go to heaven? Uh, no, no, I need an answer to this because I'm confused. I'm confused. Only people who sin differently than you can go to heaven? People who you don't like their sin, they can't go to heaven? But you still got barbecue sauce in the corner of your mouth. You still got gossip on your lips. Come on, somebody. You're in credit card debt beyond anything that you could ever pay off. You're going to die in credit card debt. You're in sin. Come on, like, how far are we going to go with this? Oh, no, but because you think that their sin's an abomination. No, honey, you're an abomination. Your self-righteousness is an abomination. The Bible says this, that your self-righteousness is as of filthy rags. You want to do an exit Jesus study on that? What a filthy rag is? I'm going to say this politically correct. It's the product that a woman uses during that time of the month. It's a used one. That's a filthy rag. And he says, your ability, your own ability to stay righteous in your own strength, your righteousness, not God's, your righteousness is as a filthy rag. That's nasty. That's nasty, and I'm embarrassed it's in the Bible. <laughs> That's nasty. But the devil never misses a chance to condemn your mind. Well, well Pastor Mike, maybe it's not the devil condemning my mind. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit convicting me. You didn't read your Bible. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. And of judgment. And it says that the Holy Spirit convicts the believer of their righteousness. Which means, which means when you are going astray or you are going right, he's like, you're righteous. You're righteous. You're righteous. You're right. That's what you should be hearing the Holy Spirit saying to you. You're righteous. You're right. Not you stupid idiot. You're so dumb. That's the accuser of the brethren. Notice I said the breastplate is two places. It's on the front and on the back. For those of you that struggle with your past, you, you, got, you got anxiety that your past is going to catch up with you and something that you did in your past. That's why he covers you on the front side and on the back side. He covers you coming and he covers you going. You're righteous. You're righteous. Pastor Mike, you need to be careful. You need to be careful preaching this stuff because you tell Christians this, they're just going to go out and sin. Christians are sinning anyway. <laughs> Only Christians can sin. An unbeliever can't sin. They are sin. They're guilty of sin. They're going to hell. Only a Christian can sin. And that's why Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin to wash you white as snow. But Pastor Mike, okay, okay, but there needs to be a balance. How do you balance? How do you balance Jesus Christ dying on the cross for all your sin and all you have to do is say, I believe? How do you, you can't balance that. You can't, you can never balance that even by living a perfect life. You can't balance that. You can never balance that but we can respond to it. We are responding to your love. Right? Resp I can respond to it. I say, because of what Jesus Christ did for me. Because of what he did for me. I will walk in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because of what he did for me. And here, here, here's the perspective change. Here's the perspective change. Many Christians are sin conscious. 
I'm going to stop doing that. 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 You're never going to stop doing the thing you keep staring at. I need to become righteousness conscious. Lord, I'm going to be like that. I'm going to be like you. Putting my eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of his faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Because even Christ had his eyes on the next horizon. Lord, I don't have to do this. I want to be more like you. It's righteousness, consciousness. If you would put on your righteousness and walk around in your righteousness and use your righteousness, it would become so shiny. It would become so strong that the desires of the old man begin to fall away. Mm. Here's what I want you to see today in the next eight minutes. Your mental attitude has everything to do with how well you do in a fight. I was a high school wrestler, and if I was like sizing up my opponent, because I always did a little bit of research who I was going to wrestle, uh, if I knew their stats, whatever, and then I would go to the, to the match and look at who it was. If I looked at them and thought, dag, I don't know. Guess what? I normally didn't win. I normally didn't win because I was already defeated in my mind. So give you a little insight of who I was back then. I had put on my death metal in my Walkman. You know, you guys didn't even know what Walkmans are. But I had a Walkman, and I put my death metal on, and I, be, and I would put, ah, 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 ah. I'd get myself all amped up, like, like, psyched. Ah, ah. I'd get my, literally, I would get myself so psyched up, like, that when I got on the mats with that dude, he wasn't fighting me. He was fighting something else. <laughs> I was into weightlifting for a long time. And if I got under the bench and I was going to go for a new PR, and I put that weight off the thing and I felt that weight on my hand, I was like, ooh, I don't know. I normally wasn't going to get it back up. But if I got under the bar, I like, and took it off and went, I normally would get that thing back up with a new PR. The battlefield was more in my mind than it was in my flesh. If I was defeated in my mind before I got into the fight, I wouldn't win. And this is what the enemy knows. If he can have you defeated in your mind, you're never going to be successful never going to get your break, never going to be recognized, never going to get your opportunity. You're not good enough. You need to do more. You need to make God proud of you. That, that's a problem. That's a problem. If you don't think God's proud of you right now. If you don't know my daddy God, the daddy God that I can get this excited about that I'm dripping sweat underneath my shirt right now, then I'm sorry that someone abused you spiritually. My daddy God, I don't have to wait for some day that I'm hoping about that I'm going to go to heaven and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You should know that every day that you wake up. You should know it every day when you wake up that your heavenly father, Yahweh God, is stinking proud of you every single day. His mercies are new every morning for a reason. Yeah, but, but there's just so much that I do. That's, so stop. That's you. You're defeating yourself in your own mind. You're disqualifying yourself from God's righteousness every day. No wonder you're getting your brains bashed in by the enemy. You're not walking around with that righteousness on. 
You're letting those negative thoughts penetrate your mind. This is why Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1.13, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. He's saying, be alert. Be alert. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God hath made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. You are righteous if you put your faith in Jesus. Develop the righteousness consciousness. I want to close with this passage in Romans 3.21. And if I was a little too ornery for you, I'm not sorry. I'm not. I'm fighting for your righteousness. I'm fighting for your freedom, even if it's from your own mind, even if it's from your own legalism, even if it's from your own bad teaching. No one here today, no one here today said it is okay to behave any way you want. No one said that today. What we're saying is what's God's response? Is he angry at you? God forbid. All anger, all wrath was put on Jesus at the cross. God's not in a bad mood. God's not in a bad mood. Romans 3.21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. Right? So the righteousness without law is now manifest. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto what? Who? Unto all who what? Believe. Righteousness is to all who believe. How many? All. Now, if you try to tell me all does not mean all, we got problems. But this is what the church says. Yes, righteousness is available to all who behave and believe. Righteousness is available to all who sin the way that I sin, and, and it's okay that way. This did not say that you had to behave before you could believe. This, oh, God. This is, what, this is what got Paul killed. This is why they killed Paul. Right here. This is why Jesus was killed. He brought to religion, he brought to religion a new hope. And the church couldn't accept it. The church couldn't accept, couldn't accept that the Gentile could be saved. That the sinner could be saved. Now listen, I don't need to go down a list of sins that you're disgusted with. I don't need to do that. You, you, you all, we all have our own bias. Can we be for real? We all have our own bias of sins that we think are disgusting. But yet, that same judgmental spirit is disgusting. Right? This says, righteousness to all who believe. Didn't say... Behave, then believe. I want you to get this today. Get this today, because this might start some more Facebook fights. <laughs> Righteousness isn't the absence of sin. It's the presence of God. Yo, you get that one? You get, you get that one? That don't make no sense. Because we were taught live righteous means to live without sin. Good luck. Good luck. The moment you overeat at Thanksgiving, you sinned. The moment you had a negative thought, you sinned. The moment you looked at yourself outside of identifying with Christ, you sinned. Righteousness is not the absence of sin. It's the presence of God. You have been made 
righteous. You have been seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. So because of that appreciation, because of that appreciation, Lord, help me. Help me to live a holy life. Help me to lay aside those things that just keep coming up in my life that are not pleasing to you. I don't want to live a life that's mispleasing to you. I want to live a life that's honoring to you. So help me. Lead me. Guide me. Direct me. And I will operate and walk around in my righteousness. I will exercise myself unto righteousness. And the more you walk around in that righteousness, the shinier you become, the bigger threat you become to the enemy. But it starts with believing. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never taken that first step to believe, to put your trust, to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, I, I know straight out that this teaching alone closes a lot of doors for me to preach anywhere. This, this one idea, this one teaching. Because if a church can, can condemn you for your behavior, they're going to keep you coming back, and then they keep getting your offering. I wasn't supposed to say that. That's like an insider. But that's why Christians are defeated. Because they're more conscious of their mistakes, they're more conscious of their sin, than they are conscious of the blood of Jesus Christ out of an appreciation for the blood of Jesus Christ, I am going to do my best to live holy before the King of Kings. If you've never had that opportunity, all you have to do is believe. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. And we do that by praying a prayer of salvation, by accepting Jesus Christ into our life. And if you're here today or watching online, you need to do that. We'd like to pray that prayer with you. Would you join me? Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer for the very first time online and you're in one of our chat rooms, would you type AMEN in all capital letters? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you for two seconds? Would you wave at me and say, hey, Pastor Mike, I prayed that for the first time. Anybody all as I look across the room real quick, gaze in the room, anybody? Yeah, I see your hand. Awesome. Anybody else real quick? Yeah, I see you. Yeah, I see you. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. That same starting point book is available to you from one of our care team members or our ushers. If you're here today and you need prayer for any reason at all, we will have care team members right here in the front. If you need counseling for any reason to sit down and talk with someone, we have licensed counselors available to you. You can call the church office or meet with someone out in the lobby to set up an appointment. Uh, whatever you came here looking for today, I pray that you don't leave without getting a hold of it, all right? Father, we thank you today that your word will not return void. This word will accomplish what you set it forth to. Lord, I pray. I pray that no one leaves here offended or conflicted or condemned. But Lord, we seek truth. Help us to understand what the finished work of the cross is and what our response that is supposed to be. Lord, I pray that as we leave here today, we are blessed. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor Josh, and if this message has impacted you in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a few things. First, I would love if you would subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. Second thing is, I'm going to ask that you would take a next step on your journey, and we'd love to help you do that. You can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today. Have a great rest of your day.